Hey yo, what's going on? Bowman1951 here. That Bowman out there, it is often very important because that's the reason this channel was started. We are going to be showing off five additions to the Bowman1951 graded PSA set. I'm not going to waste any time. Let's get right into the first one. If you've never been around for these before, there's a little history lesson that goes along with each player. So we're not just going to show the card. We're going to give a little background on them. Not everybody remembers players from the 50s other than the superstars. So we're going to get into the first one here now. Okay, up first, I usually go in order of the grades. And this is going to be a very good three of Jerry Pretty. Other than a little left-right centering, I thought this card was in really good shape. I'm not against buying threes when they look this nice. There's got to be some kind of little wrinkle there or of some sort. Haven't really figured it out just yet, but we're going to talk about Jerry now. Actually, I already did find the little wrinkle. It is going to be here. We'll zoom in on that, see if we can see it on camera. But Jerry's got an interesting little... Uh, history here. So he was paired with Phil Rizzuto in the minor leagues. They were the double double play tandem and he was a really good ball player according to Rizzuto. He actually played on one of the best minor league teams of all time ranked 12th ever. That was in 1939. He was with the Kansas City Blues. They went 107 and 47. Again ranked the 12th best minor league team of all time, but clearly he made it into the majors, and here he was on the Tigers, even though he started his career uh, with the Yankees. Famed broadcaster Mel Allen often talked about the pair, him and Rizzuto. He predicted back in the late 30s that they would become the one of the best Yankees tandems ever. That year, pretty batted 306. He had 38 doubles, 10 triples, and 16 homers, and Rizzuto was named the league MVP for his play. Rizzuto says they were quite the opposite pairing. Pretty was rather cocky, and Rizzuto was pretty shy and always worried. Says, he took me under his wing, but he loved playing tricks on me too, like nailing my shoes to the floor and ripping up my all my fan letters that I received. Those types of things. It's pretty funny. All that, the Yankees tandem never really came to fruition. Pretty struggled when he was caught up to the majors. He was only hitting around the Mendoza line and was actually asked to be traded at the end of the the 42 season. So he was off to the Washington Senators. There he played pretty well. He got his average up to 270 and uh, scored 62 runs in his first year there. Like most players of his era, he joined World War II in 1943. He was not discharged until 1946. Again, looking at an American hero here. Thank you for your service, Jerry Pretty. But uh, he ended up coming back to ball. Ended up playing, let's see here, in the St. Louis Browns in the late 40s, and then obviously the Tigers from 1950 to 1953. Last thing we're going to say about Pretty here, Rizzuto talks about him later in life and says he just doesn't know what happened to him other than some bad luck and a string of a few injuries that he had. Otherwise, he could have been up there in the ranks with a guy like Phil Rizzuto. So we're going to put this out here. Oops, we're going to go sideways on that one, and we're going to get into the second card. All right, next up is going to be William Joseph Rigney. Excellent to mint six here. The centering really isn't that good top to bottom. I pulled this one off of Com C, used some credit there, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of a stickler with the centering, so I'm a little disappointed with this one. I think I went with the grade first, didn't really check it out too closely, and, again, it was kind of free with my credit. But let's talk about Bill. I recognize him uh, right away, his name, because I've seen his cards later on in his career. He became a manager for the New York Giants. So here he was with the New York Giants in, in 1951, who then obviously became the San Francisco Giants. He was actually acquired by the Giants during the war. So 1946, right after World War II ended, uh, he was playing a third baseman, shortstop and second base. He appeared over 100 games in each of his four first seasons. So here, I guess he just played a lot with the the Giants. Didn't end up being a journeyman like many of these players I, f I find out uh, played for three or four teams up until uh, the 1951 season. Nothing stellar about his playing career. He ended with a 259 career average, 510 hits, 41 home runs, and 212 ribbies. But, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Rigney was a manager for quite some time. He started out with the AAA Minneapolis Millers in 1954. 
Then he was promoted the skipper of the Giants in 1956. He was uh, succeeding his mentor, Leo DeRocher. He was succeeding his mentor, Leo DeRocher. So his first two seasons, he actually had Willie Mays on his team, and they were pretty awful. The Giants were losing almost 90 games a season. Then they moved to San Francisco in 1958, and they were rejuvenated by the young players such as Orlando Serpeda, Felipe Alou, and Willie McCovey. So the Giants quickly turned it around in the late 50s, early 60s, when Rigney was their manager. He was actually let go at the end of the 60s season. The Giants didn't do as well as predicted. So he took over as the skipper for the Los Angeles Angels in 1961. I don't know if you knew this, but I just actually learned it. Gene Autry was the owner of the Angels when they first started out. And they went after Casey Stengel as manager. But unfortunately, Casey turned down all offers for managerial positions after he was let go of the Yank from the Yankees in the 1960 season. So Rigney ended up taking over that team. He didn't have a lot of talent on his first team that he managed. They ended up finishing, I think, uh, eighth out of ten teams in the league that year. But his second year, he ended up becoming manager of the year. And the team finished with an 86-76 and 76 record during their second season in existence. So he managed the Angels all the way up through the end of the 60s and ended up taking over the Twins in the 1970s season. He actually led the team to 98 wins that year, but unfortunately they ultimately fell to the World Series champion Baltimore Orioles in straight games to get to the World Series then. He ultimately uh, became a scout for the Padres for a bunch of years and ultimately ended up coming back to the San Francisco Giants in 1976 to end his career. Bill Rigney left this earth in 2001, and uh, he had quite the stellar managerial career. So if you didn't know anything about Bill prior to this video, I'm glad I was able to share a lot of that with you because I didn't know it myself. We're going to get Bill out here in front and on to the next card. All right, third card up is going to be Eddie Bud Stewart. Now this card looks magnificent, near mint seven. I uh, got the old, old PSA flip there. So this one has been around the block, and that's okay with me. I don't have any reason to upgrade this. And, wow, it, there's even a zero out there in front for the serial numbers. That's pretty crazy. But we're going to get into Eddie's career here. So he actually, in the late 30s, played on a team in San Diego in the minors with uh, Ted Williams. So he started out there, played up through the 50s. So he had a fairly lengthy career. He was mainly an outfielder. He started out his career with the Pittsburgh Pirates, led the whole entire league in pinch hits in 1941. After that, in 1942, he enlisted in the Army. Thank you for your service, Eddie Stewart. And he uh, left the war in 1945 when World War II ended. And he spent 1946 with the Hollywood Stars of the Pacific Coast League. And up until March of 1947, he was traded to the Yankee organization. After 47, he was with the Kansas City Blues of the American Association. And then in 48, he was with the Yankees as a teammate of Joe DiMaggio. So this guy, he played with not only Ten Williams, but Joe DiMaggio in his career. So I'm sure he had a lot of stories later on in his life to tell his grandkids. Eddie played in 773 games in his career, batting 268 with 260 RBIs and 288 runs scored. He's also a great fielder out in the outfield. After his playing days, he was a phys ed teacher out in California and left this earth in the year 2000. So that is a near mint 7, 1951 Bowman, Eddie Stewart. Card number four of five in today's video. Also going to have another fairly high grade, a near mint to mint 7, up top centering not too great left to right's pretty decent but that's probably one of the only issues with this card and that's why it graded so high you got max well first name is actually hubert max lanier max was a left-handed pitcher who spent most of it with the st louis cardinals so he was still here with the cardinals uh, as you can see in 1951 he led the national league in earned run average in 1943 and was also the winning pitcher of the clinching game in the 1944 World Series against the Crosstown St. Louis Browns. 
His son, Hal, became a major league infielder and manager as well. So many of you out there have heard of Hal Lanier before. Here's a pretty fascinating fact about Matt. So he and about a dozen other major leaguers defected to the Mexican League in 1946 after they were offered a salary that was nearly double what he was making with the Cardinals. He was disappointed by the poor playing conditions, though, once he arrived and all of the issues with allegedly broken contract promises. So he tried to return to the Cardinals in 1948, but he was actually barred by an order from the commissioner, Happy Chandler at the time. They imposed a five-year suspension on all players who had jumped to the Mexican League. So in response, Lanier and his teammate Fred Martin, as well as Danny Gardella of the New York Giants, they sued MLB in federal court, challenging baseball's reserve clause as a violation of U.S. antitrust laws. And then they were finally reinstated. They won their case back in 1949. Max ended up retiring in 1953. Over 14 seasons, he posted a 108-82 and record with 821 strikeouts. Lanier died at the age of 91 in 2007. All right, and last of this group, as I approach the 40% mark on my set, I had talked about this before where I want to get to 50% or around there right at the end of 2020. This is going to be Robert Henry Adams, near mint, or I'm sorry, excellent to mint six. Now, if you notice one thing about this card, we are up to the high numbers. So normally I like to do uh, in order from lowest grade to highest grade. Because this is a six in the high number section, this is actually, I, I treat this like an eight of the, the low numbers. So this is a beautiful card. Pretty tough to get your hands on. They're going to be uh, a lot pricier. In this range, especially for the high grades, for Bobby Adams here, let's get into some of his historic facts. So Bobby played mainly in the infield. He was a third baseman along with a second baseman, and he was a journeyman. He played for the Cincinnati Redlegs, Chicago White Sox, Baltimore Orioles, and the Chicago Cubs. So that's what he's here on this card. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's actually the Cincinnati Reds. Man, does that throw you? Doesn't that look like a Cubs hat? So yeah, he did play for 14 seasons, but a lot of that, he was a backup. Ended his career at 269 with 37 home runs and 303 RBIs in 1,280 games played over those 14 years. While his playing career wasn't that exciting, he did do some things uh, in the ranks of the minors. So following his playing career, Adams continued as a coach with the Cubs and was a member of the team's experimental College of the Coaches. In 1966, the organization named him club president of the AAA Tacoma Club Cubs of the Pacific Coast League. But Adams' six-year tenure in Tacoma ended after the 1971 season when Chicago moved its AAA affiliate to Wichita, Kansas. After that, he coached again for the Cubs in 1973, retiring from baseball in 1973 and passed away in 1997. So that's Bobby Adams, excellent to min six, card number 288. Thanks as always for watching. Love all the vintage heads out there. Really appreciate you tuning into those, these videos. I know they don't get a ton of views, but again, this is why I started the channel. This is why I love collecting the way I do. 1951 Bowman set. Really close now to the 40% mark. So if you want to see more of this as I near completion, I expect another two to three years. So videos will be around for quite some time. Please hit that subscribe button if you love what you see here go ahead and click that thumbs up as well we will see you at the next video this is bowman 1951 and i am out